Hello. Um, I think we'll get started. Uh, I think it's six o'clock now. No, my name's Anne Farrell. I'm the, uh, the state manager here at the Bureau of Meteorology. So uh, welcome everyone. It's you know great uh, to have everyone here to talk about the terrific subject we have tonight. Um, first of all, though, I'd like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners on the land in which we're meeting uh, tonight. That's the uh, the Catacal clan of the Aurora Nation as well as their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, a couple of uh, little housekeeping uh, instructions as well. Come on in everyone, there's plenty of seats in here. Um, there's always plenty at the front and in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so in terms of the housekeeping, um, there's the uh, male toilets are just through the foyer here on the left of the stairwells and the female toilets who walk um, past, the, past the lifts and it's on the <coughs> other side of the lifts. Um, and the only other housekeeping thing is the evacuation procedures, and you'll hear, um, the, I think, the fairly com uh, common tones, the, um, the whoop, 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 is the, the standby and the, um, you know, the beeping, and I think that there's, there's even an evacuate um, word that you'll hear, and um, it's the exits are down the fire stairs and the assembly area is just outside after hours, outside in the area, to, you know, follow our, our bureau leaders if, uh, if that should occur. I know it's a really, um, you know, packed uh, thing tonight with three presentations in a short time. So I'll hand over to um, Stefan Felder, who's chairing this evening. Hey, Stefan. Okay, thank you, Anne. Um, yeah, welcome, everyone. Uh, we've got a large crowd of people, and uh, I'm quite excited about the talk tonight. Um, I'm, my name is Stefan Felder. I'm an academic in the School of Civil Engineering at UNSW. And uh, I've got the honor today to um, host this event, and we've got three awesome speakers, and they are all very interesting speakers, uh, very visual speakers, so I hope you will enjoy the talks as much as I do. A um, couple of um, issues. First thing is, some of you might have missed the sign-in sheet. We decided to make it a sign-out sheet. So <laughs> then you, you can actually sign uh, the official sheet. And secondly, um, so we will have straight presentations. The speakers hopefully stick to the 20 minutes that they have. And uh, we will have questions afterwards. Okay, we will have the Q&A session at the very end. So um, I would like to introduce the first speaker. It's Dr. Craig Roberts from UNSW, and he's a surveyor and will give us important background on the uh, more theoretical part of surveying and growth. Thanks very much. All right. Now, is someone going to stick this up for me? Yeah, I'll do that. Oh, are you going to do that? Yeah, one second, sorry. Uh, heights and UAVs. Yeah, that one there. Yep. Perfect. And make it a... Make it a lot bigger. One there. Beautiful. Excellent. Great. Thanks very much. Yeah, so um, like Stefan said, uh, so I'm a lecturer in the School of Civil and environmental, so we have coffee together sometimes. Uh, but I teach into the Bachelor of Engineering Surveying, and uh, I, I find myself in these hallowed halls surrounded by the water panel, the Engineers Australia water panel. And I think we share something in common, and that is that we're interested in height. So in surveying, even though we have these amazing new gadgets, height remains a problem. And I think you guys care about height because you're interested in uh, that water should run downhill. Yeah, that's pretty important. Yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about basic surveying and lead us into that a little bit. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about basic UAVs as a bit of a handball over to Chris, who's then going to talk more about the applications of the UAVs. And perhaps you can see that he's then considered all of these things that I'm going to mention very quickly. Okay, so maybe some of you have done a bit of this in surveying 101, maybe some of them in classes with me. Yeah. yeah? GMAT 1110, you might have done a little bit of levelling, you might have had one of these sort of devices, and you might have had a staff, and you might have started at a bit of a benchmark somewhere, which might be at sea level, and you might have done some back sites and foresights and somehow propagated heights. But what you might not have realised is that as you set that device up, what you were doing was setting up with respect to gravity. You were levelling to a surface called the geoid. Yeah? Now, the thing is, we don't really know where the geoid is. We're getting closer to where the geoid is, but we're not really sure. So that's why there's a bit of a gap here. We tend to use mean sea level. Mean sea level as a proxy for the geoid. 
but it's not actually exactly the geoid. So here's the geoid, a surface on which the Earth's gravity potential is a constant, and that closely approximates global mean sea level. Approximates. Hmm. And you can see when you look at this, obviously it's grossly exaggerated, you can see there's lumps and bumps where there's mountain ranges and there's dips and things like that, yeah? But that's what the geoid looks like. The, the Germans would say it's the kartoffel, the potato. Yeah? So in Australia, we've used mean sea level as our proxy for the geoid, yeah? We've got 30 tide gauges around the mainland of Australia. And we took measurements to those tide gauges and we used that as the basis for our datum, our Australian height <coughs> datum. Yeah? And that was in 1971, and in 1983 we put two more in Tasmania and joined them up as well. So tide gauges. Tide gauges, we, we set up on the coast, we measure the mean sea level. But we've got to be careful when we put the tide gauges, yeah? So if you put a tide gauge in an estuarine current or a tidal gradient or something, you're not measuring what you want. What you want is the mean sea level. So you guys know more about that than I do. And you need to transfer the height from the tide gauge to the land. So you might need some leveling process. It could be leveling, it could be leapfrog EDM, height traversing, but it's got to be millimetres, yeah? But then the land could be moving up and down. So you could have something like this, a continuously operating reference station, GPS station, moving, measuring the tectonics and taking that out, yeah? So we're going to be thinking about all this stuff when we use tide gauges. The Australian height datum, included 97,000 kilometres of levelling. So on the physics lawn, it's about 150 metres. Yeah? And they levelled all through the country and they did all sorts of adjustments. They made zeros on all the tide gauges and propagated height across the country. Yeah? Huge effort in 1971. There's obviously some problems with the AHD. It was based on tide gauge observations for about three years, 66 to 68. The tides are mostly affected by the moon, and the moon has a cycle which repeats itself every 18.6 years. We only measured three of those years, so immediately we haven't caught the whole cycle of the moon. That's one problem. We subsequently noticed that we didn't consider the Earth, the ocean temperature. Hotter up here, colder down here, which put a tilt on the mean sea level that we measured on our tide gauges of over a metre. That's our Australian height data. We're locked into it. There's all sorts of regional distortions. Can you imagine? 45 degree heat, levelling, backsight, foresight. There's all sorts of problems in the data. And the way that we adjusted it, and of course the survey marks are 50 plus years old. They've moved. What about the black soils around Gunnada? They would have moved up and down. So we've got problems. The Australian height data is this decrepit old thing, but we all use it. Plumbers use it, so we're stuck with it. <laughs> okay. So here's our levelling that we saw before. And suddenly, GPS has arrived on the scene. The Messiah. It's here. GPS is going to save all our problems. And GPS, of course, measures ellipsoidal height. To the ellipsoid. Yeah? Oh, the ellipsoid. What's that? It's something mathematical that we've, we've invented for convenience. Hmm. So we've done all this legacy data, GPS, on the geoid. And now suddenly we've introduced the ellipsoid. Well, how do we know what the gap is between the geoid and the ellipsoid? This n value. And this has been the problem because we don't actually know where the geoid really is, but we're getting better at measuring it. Hmm. So geoid ellipsoid separation is a bit of a problem. So GPS. When we use our GPS, we get ellipsoidal heights and natively onto WGS84, which I don't like very much. Yeah? And there's this very simple formula. The height, this is what you get from your spirit levelling, is equal to the ellipsoidal height minus this n value. There it is there. But the other problem is, GPS is really weak in height. So here's the Messiah that's come along GPS, but actually it's a matter of order of magnitude worse than what you would get from levelling. Old school levelling is a very, very accurate way of propagating height. GPS, not so great in height. Hmm. Thinking about our ellipsoid. This has been a problem for centuries for geodesy. So geodesy is like the Formula One of surveying, yeah? They're trying to work out what the ma mathematically convenient shape for the third rock from the sun is, yeah? So you might 
fit something here, which sort of fits reasonably well. So the difference between the ellipsoid and the geoid, our geoid ellipsoid separation, has always been an issue for geodesists. Now GPS uses this WGS-84 system, and because we've got satellites, they fly around the centre and mass of the Earth. So WGS-84 is actually a Cartesian coordinate system. Zero, zero, zero is right there. Z goes through the spin axis of the Earth. X goes through the International Reference Meridian, which is almost Greenwich. And Y completes the system. It's X, Y's and Z's, nothing more. That's what the satellites produce, and so we care about where we are on the surface, yeah? I don't like WGS-84. The reason we went to the geocentric datum of Australia in 94 was so that our datum would be compatible with GPS. So suddenly we had a geocentric datum. Prior to that, we didn't. Yeah? Well, a lot of you have heard that we're now moving to GDA 2020 next year. Actually, we've already got it in, place, in some places. And there's a civilian version of WGS 84 called the International Terrestrial Reference Frame, which I would, I would urge you to use before you would use WGS 84. It's better, it's civilian, we have access to it. All of these are compatible with WGS 84. Yeah? Okay, I'll look sorts. <laughs> But how do we compute N? Well, N these days is a combination of historical astrogeodetic levelling, whatever that is, terrestrial gravity measurements, both uh, relative and absolute, airborne gravimetry, often along the coast, and satellite geodesy. And there's been some recent missions in the 2000s, the CHAMP mission, Gochair, GRACE missions. All of these missions have been able to get a much better realisation of the global geopotential model, yeah, the global geoid. You may have seen products on the Geoscience Australia website, ga.gov. Ausgeoid, maybe some of you guys have used Ausgeoid. I want to talk about those products a little bit because they've evolved too. We've got Ausgeoid 98, which is ellipsoidal to gravimetric geoid values. Then we went to Ausgeoid 09, which is ellipsoidal to AHD values. Osteoid 2020 is going to be ellipsoidal to AHD with uncertainty. Hmm. So we'll know if we get about an N value how good we can expect it to be. Hmm. So that's a nice advance. And you can see that there's quite a gradient here across Australia. The N value down here is minus 30. Well, meanwhile, up here, Bob Catter is typing 70 metres into his GPS. Yeah? Hundred metre change. Looking at this Ausgeoid product, if we were happily doing GPS or something on levelling on the ground surface, we'd be measuring this to our reference ellipsoid, yeah, our H value, and we'd want to correct for the n, yeah. So if we use just the gravity, we would measure ourselves up to the gravimetric geoid. But remember, the AHD had problems, didn't it? Had all those problems with bad data and slopes due to temperature and all sorts of things. So what we've done with these Ausgeoid products is we've made good data bad. Good geopotential data to work out what the gravity field looks like, we've distorted to fit the AHD. So the N AHD, this is what you get from your Ausgeoid models. They're different. Mm. So when you use the Ausgeoid, don't think that you're going onto the gravity field. You're not. You're starting with that, but you're actually distorting it. Hmm. Okay, and how good is it? Well, Ausgeoid 09, plus or minus five centimetres in an absolute sense. But it could be better in some places, could be worse in others. Sorry, could be better than five centimetres, but it won't be worse than five centimetres. Ausgeoid 2020 is coming. So Ausgeoid 2020 is going to link with... GDA 2020. Osteoid 2020 is the product for the GDA 2020. Again, it's going to be based on mean sea level. It's designed for the new datum. We'll provide uncertainty. So if we think about AHD that we get now, we can use a GDA 94 ellipsoid plus the Osteoid product will give us AHD. In the future, we'll have GDA 2020 plus Osteoid 2020 and that'll give us AHD. And the difference between these two osgeoids is nine centimetres in height, and that's because there's been some mm, augmentations 
to the, geo, to the ellipsoid that is the basis for these datums. And it's had the effect of changing the height by about nine centimetres. So that's significant. Please be careful. Don't accidentally use Osgeoid 2020 with GDA 94 or vice versa. You'll introduce problems. Yeah. So this is something that I really want to mention to you guys. Be careful when you move to, to, to the uh, 2020. Okay, and there's, I've got a link, link here. I think I'm going to give these slides to you guys somehow. Um, okay, so why am I telling you all this? Because water runs downhill on the geoid, but not necessarily on the ellipsoid. So we want to be on the geoid if we can. So be careful with which height system you're using. Rightio. Now, push the time, so I'm going to jump to UAVs now. So I want to talk basically about UAVs. Essentially, we've got two sorts of UAVs. We've got fixed-wing UAVs, we've got multi-rotor UAVs. The uh, fixed wings have advantages. They're pretty simple, high speed, they can fly for quite a long time. But the disadvantages is they need a bit of long takeoff, they can't hover, and generally, once they've got a sensor in them, you can't, they're a bit inflexible. Whereas the multi-rotor, they're kind of more complex, a bit more low speed, use up a bit more batteries, but you can take off vertically, you can put different sorts of sensors on them, and they can hover and stare things, yeah? Really a great advantage. So, horses for courses. Uh, I introduced this new term here, remotely piloted aircraft. You could say unmanned aerial vehicles or remotely piloted aircraft. Same thing. Here's a whole bunch of sensors that you might want to put on those, uh, those drones. A few things to consider with the drone that you have. Image distortion and camera selection. You could get a pretty cheap lens, and you can expect some distortion. Or you could get a geometric camera, or you could calibrate the lens and overcome problems like this, where you might have some distortions here, but afterwards you can straighten that out when you remove the lens distortion. Similarly, the sort of shutter that you have on your camera has an effect. Yeah, You need to be careful because your drone is moving. Mm, it has an effect. So really recommended is this mechanical leaf shutter. Reduces the distortions. Things like this. Yeah, which might be bent over, it straightens up if you use the right sort of shutter. So things to consider in just the devices that you use on your drone. The flight planning is really important. This is photogrammetry 101. Yeah, we all know we've got two eyes and we can see overlap and we can see depth because of that. And that's the principle of photogrammetry. You take lots of photos, yeah? And you overlap them. And somehow you've got to link them all together so that the pixels over here and the pixels over there are all on the same system. Yeah, so you can rely on it. So we want a lot of overlap. That's very important. And I know that Chris is going to talk about that. The flight planning is really user-friendly. And there's a few parameters. You could imagine that the higher you are, then the bigger your ground sample distance will be, your, your ground resolution will be, yeah? And that if you change the amount of overlap, lateral overlap, longitudinal overlap, if you change that, you would change how far apart the flight plane is. You can put the parameters in. You can say, I want this area. The flight plan will be devised and you upload it into the bus, throw it off and it flies along that plane. Yeah, amazing. How do you link it all together? Well, traditionally in photogrammetry, you would use aerial triangulation. And I like this. You have ground control points. Basically, I don't know, a carpet tile with a big white cross on it. Yeah, throw a bunch of ground control points around the area. Make sure they get picked up in the image. Make sure you have lots of overlap. You can then measure those points with GPS. Should do it twice. It's a little bit time consuming. But what you can then do in the software is you can say, ah, oh, this point, which appears on eight different overlapping images, is this coordinate. This point is this one. And the software can line it all up together, georeferencing. So that's called indirect georeferencing. Not quite as convenient, but more reliable. Nowadays, we have direct georeferencing because we have this whiz-bang RTK GPS, real-time kinematic. As, as the platform flies, we can get two-centimeter positioning in real time. There's the position, bang, photo. There's the position, photo. We've got inertial measurement units, which give us pitch, yaw, and roll. We've got all of this in the device. You don't need any ground control points. Yeah? So you can just fly over it, 
and then go home and then process and you get a good result. I feel very nervous about that. I'm a cynical old surveyor. I feel very nervous about that. Um, but we have done some checks and it is comparable. So Chris might have a few words to say about that too. Let's say we're flying over terrain, which has quite a large change in height. You could imagine that at the focal plane, one millimeter might only be this big on the ground, whereas here it might be 10 meters on the ground. It changes depending on your height, so that's an issue. We thought about this with a thesis I did with students ages ago. This is Baron Joey. You might see the folks from Home and Away running around down there. We launched at about 40 metres, and by the time we got out to about here, that was 120 metres. That's as high as we were allowed to fly. And we looked at the ground sample difference, distance and, and a few things like that. So the, the, the ground sample was about two centimetres up here and about six centimetres down here. That's a consideration when you're building your models. Yeah? So just to think about those sorts of things. What if the conditions are windy? You look at the tech specs, it says, oh, we can, we can take seven kilometres per second or 14 kilometres per second. But if it is windy, it's just a little drone, 700 grams blowing around in the wind. And you can see that your, your flight plan is going to be a little bit wobbly, right? Which means that your, your model is going to have less matched feature points. It won't be quite so good. So, sure, you can fly it, but don't expect it to be as good. It is a problem. It's a consideration. What about if you're looking at a water surface? So here you can see there's a river that runs through here, sort of a sandy, dirty coloured river. It's a flat surface, right? It's quite hard for the photogrammetry algorithms to map. So you might end up with something that looks a little bit funny here. So it can be hard photogrammetrically to map something on flat water surface. What about, you make a you make a digital elevation model. You've flown, you've got a whole bunch of images, you make a digital elevation model. It looks fantastic. You put your cursor on it, you get height on it. Is it right? So we did some work where we, we um, did some RTK as well on the ground that we used as control. Yeah? We compared that with what we got from the model. And we wanted to look at different ways that you could do this. So just with a single flight plus nadir images, meaning looking straight down. Yeah, no gear images. And there's the flight plan. We had six ground control points, 120 metres height, 80% overlap, 110 images, and the mean was about six centimetres, standard deviation 5.7. So we thought, hmm, can we do better than that? So then we had done two flights. So we had the 120 and at 80 metres, but in the opposite direction. So crossover, yeah? Does that have an effect on your model, is the model a little bit better? The point cloud minus the RTK strings, not much better. 5.7, 5.4, not that much better. What about if you fly at 120 and then have another at a bit lower, not quite sure how high that was, with oblique images. So rather than having the deer images, fly obliquely in a pattern, yeah? What effect does that have? Quite a good effect. The mean comes right down. The standard deviation is not too bad either. So flying obliquely, that could be something to do with your flight plan. Second to last slide. Am I doing okay? Second to last slide. So considerations for best practice using UAVs and aerial mapping. Maybe think about some of these things when you see all the whiz bang things that Chris is going to show us next. Your accuracy depends on your ground sample dif distance, which relates to the height. Your overlap you're looking at somewhere between 70 and 90%. And your ground control points, you're going to want five at least. Yeah? And more is good. When you measure it, you measure it with RTK, but maybe not standing there with a pole like that. Maybe use a bipod. And you should come back after half an hour and re-measure it and compare the coordinates. Yeah? So double occupation. Why do you wait half an hour? Because the GPS constellation changes a little bit. You get independent results. Uh, oblique images can improve the accuracy significantly. What time of the day are you flying? What sort of light conditions do you have? You're taking photos. Uh, large elevation variations. Uh, you might want to be consider that. I understand there's now algorithms that can actually follow terrain. Maybe um, Chris might mention that. Um, the ground speed, the resolution of your optical sensor using a leaf shutter and high quality cameras. If you're going to, if you want really good high quality results, you should spend some money and get good cameras. So that's a bunch of stuff about UAVs and some basics to think about. And just as a little reminder, be careful with heights. <laughs> that's me and Yosemite.
Thank you, Chris. That was Craig. a very uh, Craig. Sorry, uh, that was a very good start uh, to bring us all up to speed about the heights and uh, the more basic surveying aspects of drones. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce now Chris Drummond from the Water Research Lab, and Chris will uh, show us some really nice videos, photos from some of this experience that he has with the drone pilot. Thank you, Stefan. <clears throat> Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, so just moving on from what Craig set the scene in terms of height datums and the uh, theory behind drones and photogrammetry and the like, I'll be providing a showcase on a number of different applications of drone technology that I've used um, in the water engineering sector. I'm a coastal engineer and I've been using drones for uh, close to six years. So I've got quite a few examples and I hope you enjoy it. So I'll be talking about three case studies tonight. The first one will be talking about <coughs> Port Botany just down the road adjacent to Sydney Airport and just discussing some of the regulations associated with flying drones. I'll then talk about some wetland restoration monitoring we've been doing at Tomago Wetland up near Newcastle. And finally, I'll touch upon a beautiful sunny reef lagoon in the Cook Islands where I had to spend uh, close to a month last year to do some drone surveys. So. I hope you enjoy the ride and let's start with Port Botany. So we've spoken about the theory behind drones, but as you may be aware, there's quite a lot of regulation about where you can and can't fly drones. So the Civil Aviation Authority have come up with a bunch of rules that you must adhere to. And that's uh, something you need to adhere to whether you're flying for fun or whether you're flying commercially. So a few of them are up the top here. The main ones are you can't fly higher than 120 meters without approval. Uh, you need to stay close. You need to stay 30 meters away from people. You can't fly over people. You can only fly one drone at a time. Uh, you always need to see the drone, visual line of sight. Even though a lot of these drones can fly up to two kilometers away, you can't see it. And Cass's idea is that if you lose control, you need to be able to control it using your eyes. Um, you need to fly. Uh, you can't fly over people in populous areas. And the last one, which is most important for Port Botany is you can't fly within five and a half kilometers of a controlled aerodrome. As you can guess, Sydney Airport is right next door to Port Botany, so I had to get approval to fly a drone there. It was a bit touch and go whether I thought I'd get approval, but um, I took a stab and it paid off. So here we are here at Port Botany. Um, you can see the red uh, area here is the, the area that uh, you need approval to fly um, in as a commercial operator. Um, don't even think you can get approval if you don't have a, a commercial drone license. You might also notice that Sydney Harbour is also a no-fly zone. Um, that's because there's a lot of traffic with sightseers and the like there. But let's focus on Port Botany. Um, so Port Botany, Sydney, um, it supports a lot of trade coming in and out with container ships. Uh, and there's a number of breakwaters uh, that protect this um, because it is open to the ocean and under certain swell conditions, you can get quite large waves that come into Port Botany. So there's a very large breakwater here called Banks Meadow Revetman, which I'm going to focus on today. Um, and it was built in the 1970s using a combination of concrete army units as well as rock rubble units. Um, and we, were, um, we partnered with NSW Ports to do an asset inspection of those areas that are highlighted there. Um, and drone technology was seen as one of the real um, the most efficient way to capture their assets so they can manage it into the future. So it was a baseline data set. Uh, at its closest point up here at Fishburn Road, it's 200 metres from the runway. So you, you physically cannot get closer to the airport than this. Um, it's the most congested airspace in Australia. So CASA were very concerned about safety to her excuse me, to other aeroplanes, which it's their job. So as I said, it was a lengthy approval process through CASA. It probably took about three months in order to get approval, but it was possible. So even though it was approved, there were a number of conditions attached to me being able to fly this little drone here, a Phantom 4. So I had to stay below 50 meters above the ground, and that was because there were obstructions such as um, container ship cranes that were 50 meters. So their idea was that there's no chance that an aeroplane is gonna be lower than 50 meters, and if it is, it's a problem that a drone's not going to um, <laughs> cause any more uh, problems on top of it. Um, I had to make contact with the air traffic control tower at Sydney. I needed to call in every morning to make sure it was okay to fly. 
I had to put geofencing on the drone so if it found itself outside a bounding box it would come home or land in the water was Cass's preference. Um, the other thing is I had to notify all aeroplane pilots that I was flying a drone through a bulletin system that they're supposed to check before they fly called a notice to airman or a NOTAM. I had to have an observer for situational awareness just standing there looking for helicopters and um, things that could um, cause, just making sure I didn't conflict as a drone with aircraft and I had to close a road adjacent to the survey. But those six things were not the hardest thing for me to comply with. The hardest thing was that the drone had to be tethered to the ground at all times. My drone had to be physically restrained from flying anywhere near the airport. Um, so what does that look like? How can you tether a drone? Doesn't that defeat the purpose? All of these things I can't answer, but that's what I had to comply with. So. After much toing and froing, I came up with a sophisticated tether system that complied with CASA, which was essentially a drone with some carabiners, <laughs> some 100 pound braid fishing line, which could not be broken by the drone, we tested it, and it was attached to this string, which was attached to my lovely colleague, Rob, who was my tether operator. So he's my third person in my team. He had a fishing reel attached to him <laughs> to a climbing harness. He weighs about... I won't tell him, uh, he's not here tonight, he weighs about 90 kilos, this drone weighs 2 kilos, it's not going to fly away. So, that's what it looks like to tether a drone. Um, you may consider that it's less safe to people on the ground putting a fishing line to a drone, but from Cass's point of view, safety to aircraft is paramount. So that's why I tethered it. So, Craig spoke about flight planning. It's very important when you do photogrammetry that the drone flies in nice straight lines and takes photos exactly where you want it to in order for the photogrammetry to work. Imagine you've got a fishing line attached to this drone. You do not want to put it on autopilot. So I had to fly this entire mission manually, which meant I needed to be quite good at making sure I was flying in a straight line, that my spacing was 80 to 90% overlap laterally, um, and also that my heights were consistent. So what you can see here is um, those are all lots of, different, um, lots of different images taken by the drone. You can notice that not only have I taken top-down or nadir photos, I've also taken oblique images from a range of different um, angles. Um, and you'll notice that there's a bit of overkill here. I took, how many, how many did Craig take? 300? 110. 110. 110. I took 3,300 images because I was only given approval to fly on three dates. I was not going to get approval for other dates, so I went overboard. You probably needed about half this number, but better to be sure. Um, so with that number of photos, we managed to get a ground sampling distance of 1.2 centimetres per pixel. So each pixel had a footprint of 1.2 centimetres. And as Craig mentioned, it's really important, Scott, excuse me, it's very important that your ground sampling distance is as small as feasible because that's related to your your Z accuracy. So if you were flying higher, your Z accuracy gets worse because of the way that photogrammetry triangulates heights. Um, our average point density was close to a thousand points per meter squared, which blew out my point cloud to 240 million data points. Um, it was a big file and it took two days to process on my gaming laptop that I convinced work to buy for me. Um, so here's just an example of, uh, this is Pix4D, which is one of the photogrammetry software packages. You can see all of these yellow lines are the rays looking at the same point, and this is the process by which photogrammetry works. So Craig mentioned uh, validation and checks of your data. Um, even though suppliers of drones that are, have RTK receivers in it, they will claim you do not need to collect ground control points. I can tell you without a doubt this is false. You need to always check your data, and I've been burning the past by following a marketing uh, claim rather than testing it in the field. So you always need ground control points. When you're on a revetment like this, it's quite difficult to get your ground control points distributed evenly over the survey site. You need to get vertical differences as well as spatial differences and traverse your way over it. Here's an example of a ground control point on Banks Meadow Revetment, and here's one of the carpet tiles that Craig was talking about. So here are the ground control points that I took uh, on the Banks Meadow Revetment. 
I took a total of 40 ground control points, which I used to distort my point cloud to tie it down onto the data. But I also had 35 checkpoints, which are independent checks of the data, which are not used to check, that are, that are not used to distort the point cloud. If you're using any drone data and someone is giving you the accuracy, do not trust the ground control point accuracy because of course it's going to be the most perfect where the photogrammetry is pulling it down to your ground control point. You want to know what the accuracy is on independent checks. Um, the other thing, uh, comparing it with these checkpoints, we managed to get root mean square errors of around two centimeters in the X and the Y and four centimeters in the Z, which fits with the theory that your Z is not quite as good as your X and your Y. So this is an example of the point cloud. You can see that there's quite a good um, level of detail here. Um, but if there's anyone there that's looking at proposing to their partner, a lot of the effort is done as someone has already written, will you marry me on Banks Meadow Revetment? So the stage is set if you wanted to duck up there tomorrow and propose to your partner. That's so romantic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, concurrently, a bathymetry survey was conducted by, uh, I think, the Port Authority. Um, and this makes me very happy. You can see that my datums are lining up. So hydrographic surveyors like to work in port datums. I like to work in AHD. And I was very happy when I plotted the two and they overlapped perfectly. So here's just a fly through of the data set. Um, this unfortunately is not one that I've cleaned. You can't trust the data through the water. So you crop all that out before you um, deliver it to the client. But you can kind of see the um, just the, the quality of the data and um, just yeah, how dense the point cloud is. So I'll just flick forward to the next one. We won't have, well, let's hook around the corner. I went to the effort, so you can watch it. <laughs> you can notice these telegraph poles. They caused all sorts of dramas for me and my tethered drone. I did actually get stuck on one of these telegraph poles, but no, the drone did not crash. All right, let's move on to a second case study. So, Tomago Wetland is just nearby uh, Newcastle. Um, this is an example of me catching the fixed wing drone. I catch it because I don't want dirt and sand in the sensor. And this thing weighs, you know, 500 grams, so it's not gonna hurt me. I could watch that all day. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so why are we interested in Tomago? It's a 500 hectare site um, and the reason we're interested in it is because um, it's an offset, an environmental offset, because another area of habitat was destroyed. Uh, as part of the conditions of consent, they had to rehabilitate somewhere else. So uh, WRL assisted over the last 10 years to restore the site from an acid sulfate rich area that was providing no value to anyone, environmentally or to the community. We transferred it into, transformed it into a, a restored tidal wetland um, and in order to do that, we developed a hydrodynamic model to figure out where the water was going to propagate onto the wetland. And since it's been, um, since we have implemented the project, we've been monitoring it with a number of different um, remote sensing techniques. So today I'll talk about the uh, multispectral imagery from a fixed wing drone, as well as elevation um, changes in landform monitoring using <laughs> photogrammetry and LIDAR. So here's an example of a survey that I did at Tomago at the end of last year. Um, on the left here, you can see the, um, this is the ortho photo from the photogrammetry. So it stitches all the photos together and gives you a nice near map or Google Earth style image. And on the right hand side is the output from a multispectral sensor. So the multispectral sensor, it takes a photo and what you do is you convert it to what's called an NDVI index or a normalized difference vegetation indice which is a measure of how much chlorophyll uh, an object is, uh, is emitting. So that is used as a proxy for how healthy vegetation is, but it can also be used to delineate different types of vegetation. So in this case here, it's a bit hard to see, but this is muddy kind of areas where there's not a lot of vegetation and we're getting NDVI values that are very low. Whereas over here, there's quite dense vegetation. We're getting very high NDVI values close to one. I haven't done this work yet, but I will soon be working with ecologists to turn this map into a map of different types of vegetation. But let's zoom in on a little part of the, the wetland here and let's have a look at uh, some drone LIDAR deployment. So this is using our LIDAR system over here. Um, it's quite a complicated system. There's a lot of things that I'm supposed to know what they do. Trust me, I do. Um, but it's very complicated using a LIDAR system for a number of reasons. The first is that 
In order for you, you to get accurate data out of LiDAR, you need to know where you are very, very accurately because it's about timing how long it takes for a pulse to return to the drone. So to do that, you need to have two RTK GPSs, or there's a number of different ways. This system uses two RTK sensors to figure out which direction it, it's facing and where, it's, where it is. But you also need to have a very expensive IMU to get the pitch, the roll, and the yaw. So let's do a bit of a, you know, a powwow, LiDAR versus photogrammetry. A lot of people ask me, Chris, what's better, LiDAR, what's photogrammetry? They're kind of different systems for different applications, but let's test them against one another. So here is a transect through the wetland, and we've got a slice of photogrammetry in the, in the green and LiDAR in the red. One thing you might notice is that the LiDAR is picking up on the trees, whereas the photogrammetry is not. But you've also got these large areas here where the, the photogrammetry, it's just fallen to pieces. It gets confused, it can't see the ground. So as a result, you just get no data in the trees around here. It also doesn't pick up on the tops of these little woody trees here. So um, it's something to consider. What are you using your data for and what is it fit for purpose? So let's do a bit of a comparison. So photogrammetry, if we take the Phantom 4 RTK here, you can buy it for about $8,000, but then you've also got to um, process it. So you can buy photogrammetry software anywhere from $2,000 to $7,000, or you could pay by usage. Whereas this LiDAR system, uh, I believe it costs about $100,000, but it's an entry-level LiDAR system. You could pay anywhere up to $250,000 for a good quality LiDAR system. So they're very different ballpark costs for the system. Um, one of the biggest advantages I find of photogrammetry is it natively gives you the color of each pixel. So not only do you know the height, you know what color it is. LiDAR, when you get it out of the box, doesn't give that to you. It's just an elevation and I've been stuck in the past when I've tried to analyze my point cloud. What am I looking at? If you don't have a color, it's very difficult to figure out what you're looking at. There are some systems that allow you to colorize the LiDAR, but um, it's, it gets more complicated and in some instances, you fly the LiDAR and then you throw up one of these little phantom drones and create a point cloud that you then use to colorize the LiDAR. Um, the other thing is photogrammetry. If you can't see the ground, you don't get any data, whereas the LiDAR has some ability to penetrate through the veg, either by having such a high density of points or being able to penetrate through it with the first return, a second return, and so forth. Um, I would say that photogrammetry using a drone like this seems a lot more mature and a lot more plug and play whereas with the lidar system it's still emerging and it um it just makes it a lot more time consuming to use if i'm on site i can have the phantom 4 up in the air within five minutes whereas it takes me two hours to get this lidar set up so it depends what you're trying to use it for but you do tend to get better accuracies with the lidar system all right i'll talk about my last case study here and just to wake you all up, I'll transport you to a Pacific island. Uh, we're at Rarotonga in the Cook Islands. And it's a beautiful area and it supports the island. The island relies on this particular part of the, of the, the area because of the tourists. It, tourism is a massive uh, part of the economy here. And you can see why with white sandy beaches like this. But there is some trouble in paradise. The tourists only come when it looks beautiful and nice to swim in. However, if we do the zoom out, there is some trouble. What's the trouble? The issue is poo. <laughs> when you live on an island, poo is a big problem. Um, on Rarotonga, there are no wastewater treatment plants because there's no space, the footprint to build one, it's just not there. So as a result, all of the islands and the hotels tend to use septic tank systems, which have been slowly leaching nutrients out into the bottom of the lagoon. <clears throat> What does that cause? So the consequence is it causes these very large blooms of algae um, and weed that smothers the bed, it kills the ecology, um, and it scares off the tourists. So this is a big issue for the Cook Islands who rely on tourists. So why were we involved? So we were um, commissioned to figure out how water was moving around this lagoon system. And in order to do that, we had to build a hydrodynamic model. So the best way to build this was to use a drone to capture data about that outer edge of the lagoon 
um, which is what was the driving force for where the water was coming in or out of the lagoon and how water flushed around. So to do that, we were using our trusty SenseFly EBRTK fixed wing drone. Um, <coughs> this thing is probably outdated technology now, but we've, um, we've had it for four years and it does a good job. Um, when we bought it, it was about $40,000, but now it's probably not worth that much because they've upgraded to selling a bigger and better system. Um, it is, it's got a little sensor inside it that takes quite high quality images with a, um, with a mechanical shutter rather than a rolling shutter. Um, you can see my flight planning there. I was using a terrain follow function to make sure my ground sampling distance was consistent. And as I launched the first time, I was very grateful that it didn't land in the palm trees. So you can see these things take a lot of space to take off. Uh, once we collected the data, we fed it into our photogrammetry software and generated the point cloud. One thing you'll notice in this point cloud is that it, even though this is water, it's giving us data where there's water. Now, while photogrammetry cannot be trusted in most circumstances on the water, when you're on crystal clear water like this, you do get a data return, but it is not correct because it doesn't account for the refraction of light. So you can see some weird artifacts happening on the elevation data here, but we've been working on a few algorithms which can take the photogrammetry data through the water, correct for the refraction of light, and you can get some bathymetry. It may not be survey grade, but when you're building a hydrodynamic model, it's a lot better than no data at all. So because we didn't really know if that was going to work, I had to jump in a kayak and paddle my way up and down to get a nice grid for the hydrodynamic model. Um, and so the drone was used for the land and the islands and this fringing reef system, and we collected some other bathymetry data to merge it all together. We built a hydrodynamic model and had a look at where currents were going from and to, and lo and behold, we had some stagnant waters here, which is where the algae and weed tended to grow. So... The last thing that I'll leave you on is in the Cook Islands and when you're using drones, you need to make sure you check in with the locals. And why is that? Because sometimes when you're flying a phantom drone, the local dogs, then there's quite a few stray ones, they don't like it and this can be the result. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, I'll leave you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the third speaker, it's Tim Hill from Sydney Water, and he will uh, present an innovative study where Sydney Water used a uh, drone to collect some water of places they hadn't been able to access before. So it's yeah. nice. Hello, I'm Timothy Hill. Thanks for having me today. Um, so I'm from Sydney Water, I'm an environmental scientist, um, and I uh, started my career there working in water quality in the laboratories out there. So um, uh, the story today's presentation is about um, this bit of a case study into the um, concept, development, and design of a water sampling drawing. Um, within the <coughs> business. So, um, just for background of Sydney Water, um, it's a state owned uh, utility. Um, we supply drinking water to 5 million customers. Um, we operate uh, from far north of um, Brooklyn on the Penn River, west in the Blue Mountains to Mount Victoria, and south all the way down to um, uh, Kaima. So, massive operational area. Uh, so, most people not only using water for potable water supply, but we also supply uh, wastewater, recycled water, and about 25% more stormwater um, in that operational area. So that includes large stormwater trunks close to the Sydney CBD, such as the Cooks River, Alexandria Canal, and the big ones. Um, so drones um, have finally found a place in city water. Uh, it's taken uh, quite a while. Um, when I started um, my concept of a water sampling drone at the time was back in 2016, 2015-16, so it was probably um, not quickly taken up, but a lot of R&D and hard work um, got off the ground. Uh, so now it's um, becoming very mature and is getting rolled into a lot of the um, 
uh, within digital services, within all their censoring, metering um, strategies. Uh, so um, looking into the impact of drones, probably the biggest drivers around improvements around, you, can't, you might be able to read this, but around safety, operational, um, operational efficiencies and methods ultimately to our customer. Um, so uh, I guess early on, drones by concept were only going to be used for asset inspections. That was probably the, the biggest and most obvious um, uh, function that a drone could provide through um, video graphic monitoring. So City Water owns um, a lot of uh, water reservoirs. So this is uh, referred to as an elevated reservoir. So um, we have inspectors who have to scale these reservoirs, inspect the circumference, um, a lot of the um, structures uh, on various regimes, depending on the um, asset itself. So a, a, drain, a drone was a no-brainer um, to come in to replace, replace that. So um, at the time, um, water sampling, um, took a big part um, of the business. So uh, Sydney Water actually um, uh, used to manage all the bulk water supplies, so all the drinking waters, what became Sydney Catchment Authorities, now Water New South Wales. Um, so there's a lot of monitoring up on uh, dams, so Warragam Dam, down to the um, Nepean Dam, um, down around the Illawarra area. Um, so um, access, egress was always a big issue. Um, we obviously use boats. Um, to ac access surface waters for water quality monitoring um, and often encountered access issues such as this. So the drone by concept was a safety driver um, to be used to access difficult locations to complete a physical task of collecting a, um, a sample of water to retrieve um, for uh, water quality analysis. Um, so as I explained, safety was probably the biggest driver first in, um, um, foremost for this initiative, um, uh, eliminating, eliminating um, difficult um, to access sites. However, um, we actually um, started our, our first operational run focused on sites which we were previously were never able to access, which I'm going to share with you today. Um, so part of the brief um, when we count the concept was um, a collection of discrete um, surface water sample uh, capable of um, a collection of up to two litres. Um, and we're aiming for about a 15 to 10 to 15 minute flight time with a full payload of, of that sample. Um, so two kilograms of water plus um, the pump and reservoir housings, which we fit to, uh, fit to it. Uh, so City Water has a NADA accreditation at the laboratories. So um, part of brief, uh, part of our scoping was creating a mechanism that um, complies with our accreditation. So um, materials um, was very important um, you know, part of this um, project. Uh, so we came up uh, with a water sampling drone. So uh, we went um, to the market looking for um, drone developers or um, a consultant uh, in this area and found at the time um, almost no one. Um, a few YouTube videos of people who retrofitted a few things but there was nothing commercially available and there's no one who actually was providing that type of service um, at um, obviously external city water. So we came across two drones um, who uh, uh, operate within Sydney, um, who jumped at the challenge. It was obviously an R&D project. They got on board um, very quickly. Um, so we went ahead and um, developed the, this is the first first cut of the water sampling drone. Um, so obviously a big guy over there, obviously capable of a large payload. Um, so going into more detail, but basically uh, we attached a reservoir, a pump system, and a suction line system, uh, which I'll go into more detail. Uh, so this is a reservoir housing, so um, that can be uh, removed from the drone itself. Uh, so um, two litre uh, container uh, with HDP plastic. Um, so I mentioned before, um, part of the brief was um, had to comply with our uh, and to comply with our NADA accreditation, so our materials um, key. So we utilised uh, materials that are already um, accredited um, for our for water sample collections. Um, and probably just a nicer image um, for um, at, uh, housing. Um, these are our pump systems um, and our suction line. So at the end here, we attached. Um, uh, so we've got about uh, anywhere between a three and four metre suction line and we, we just attached a coarse filter um, to add weight um, and to um, filter out large 
particulate matter from the, the um, bodies of water that we're sampling from. Um, so in our first, um, first cut of the drone, we installed it with one pump, so a peristatic pump um, attached to a silicon suction line. Again, um, trying to standardize it with our um, already mature um, sampling methodologies um, uh, just to um, pump up a sample. Uh, what we found during our early trial and error um, stages was um, we would pump up um, sample, but we needed to um, irrigate our sample container. We had to flush it with a couple of litres of sample water uh, that we were collecting. Um, so we built it with a um, little, little uh, overflow um, outlet, um, but it was taking quite a lot, lot of time to pump up and flush through, especially when flying remotely at sites. So um, we further developed the drone and installed uh, two uh, parasitic pumps. So basically um, a pump forward and a pump reverse uh, mechanism. So pump forward into reservoir um, and then pump reverse to empty the reservoir, pump forward again. So enabling us to flush our sample container two to three times with our sample water. Uh, this is to guarantee um, uh, quality of sample and guarantee results for the purposes of what we're calling monitoring. Um, uh, so that's just the, the, in essence, the unit, uh, that we, um, uh, attach to our drone. Um, so, uh, as lightweight as possible. Um, so our first, first drone, um, the actual, um, housing itself, uh, we've changed, uh, um, we dropped about 400 grams in our second, um, version just by using a different, uh, plastic material. Um, and now I'm gonna, this is um, our first test flight of our drone. Um, when we first, um, first got it. So it um, took us about 12 months of, of um, basically uh, testing and building in the lab. And then we went out to one of our wastewater treatment um, facilities out in Northwest Sydney, um, out of an appropriate aerodrome. Um, and basically uh, flew from the car park to one of our open reservoirs. So it's a wastewater treatment plant. So, um, our, um, for our first sample, so, um, this is, we'll see our sphere, um, our consultants that we engaged. So literally from the back of our, our vehicle, from the car park area, as you can see that it's got a, uh, it's had a um, 2.5 meter suction line with our suction line, with our um, course filter on the end. Uh, so first day, first test flight was um, under pretty optimal conditions, um, pretty minimal wind. Um, so it all, all went very well. So um, I guess what some of the findings were um, um, from our first flight was our um, approach to our um, surface waters sample collection, so getting height. So this is an example of a very controlled um, environment, um, still water, minimal wind, and no water movement. So um, obviously under very controlled conditions. Um, however, um, once we started operationalizing the, the drone itself, um, our first um, uh, sampling location was probably still our most challenging location. I'll share, share that with you shortly. So. In essence, uh, collect your sample and then subsample uh, into uh, sample containers for um, water quality analysis, water quality analysis on site, uh, or subsampling into containers for analysis back in laboratories. That's pretty much. So. Um, our first um, need for the water sampling drone uh, came into the um, about uh, six months after that um, was along the eastern suburbs um, peninsula of Sydney. Uh, so this is the uh, tip of the peninsula up around the Watsons Bay area. So uh, this area, um, is, for those that you don't know, um, is about a 60 to 80 metre uh, sheer cliff face um, from the, the top of the escarpment straight down to um, the, o the ocean. So that's open ocean, so Tasman Sea there. It's so subject to a lot of wind, a lot of swell. Um, so city water um, has uh, nearshore ocean outfalls along this area, um, uh, which have never been um, thoroughly monitored 
uh, for water quality. So um, historically, water quality has been monitored here uh, by boat. So coming in through from the harbour out around the open water and getting as close as we could um, to the, um, uh, the uh, wash zone um, or the rocks um, along this area. Um, so historically, um, they've been able to get to about 100 metres um, um, to that wash zone to um, collect our samples in the um, near shore outlets uh, uh, actually at the uh, cliff face. So 100 metres was the closest sampling point um, ever. Um, couldn't go any closer. Um, some significant safety issues with um, getting boats to um, rocks, obviously, um, capsize and, and whatnot. So uh, we used the drone um, to fly off um, uh, th the three fixed sampling points um, we deployed from uh, with monitoring transects from at um, the wash zone, uh, 25, 50 metres, 100 metres um, off offshore. Um, so those um, fixed sampling points. So those um, wash zones at 25 and 50 metres, up to 100 there, um, location, locations we've never been able to access uh, before without the um, interaction of this type of um, equipment. So uh, this is one of our um, deployment um, sites, um, um, number two on that previous map. Um, so literally deploying um, from the top of the escarpment, um, about 60 metres down to um, sea level. So again, um, uh, there was a lot of um, requirements to, um, to actually uh, carry out these flights. Um, we had to have favourable wind conditions, swell conditions less than about a metre, um, and we had um, multiple um, observers. Um, mainly um, the biggest um, uh, risk was uh, the drone getting engulfed by um, swell, by uh, large swell sets. Um, so we, we actually um, added an extra metre of suction line um, uh, onto the drone. So we had a total of four metres, um, just some tethers, about a metre from uh, the end, so we had a good idea um, of distance from um, our sample point, our surface water. Um, and uh, I guess part of the brief of the drone is we, we went for a pump system where we could pump up to six to seven metres, so we still had a lot of um, uh, uh, clearance there. However, it definitely did consume a lot of battery uh, in the process because uh, of that large amount of draw. Um, and so this is a very, uh, this is one of our recent um, sampling um, runs off for clues, which is a video. Um, it's a very shaky video, so apologies for the, um, the quality. Uh, so this was actually one of our largest swell, swell days. So that's actually about a one, one to 1.2 metre um, well. Um, yeah, so probably about two metres. If you want to keep working your arm, actually get some shots of you. Operating. And that's that's it. <laughs>
yeah, east Sydney northern fight about 1.8 meters yeah these are a bit different so, for us yeah, yeah it is it is but there's all sorts of um, transformation parameters that can get you from 94 to 2020 and if you look on the geoscience australia website there's a whole bunch of products that we're producing for people just like you who want to do things like that move from 94 to 2020. i'm gonna go look yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. awesome thanks uh, chris thanks so how you going Good. There's a quick question. How do you overcome the problem with the battery for the Matrix C100? So I, with the lighter? Yeah, so I mean the biggest issue I think with, um, with LiDAR systems is the, the flight time. So a drone this big with a sensor this small, I think is the optimal power to weight ratio. So this flies for about 30 minutes under good conditions. Yeah. But the moment you up the sensor size from you know a tub of butter to a three three kilo lidar system you need to go to a, a, a drone this big to hold the thing up you need more batteries and then you're heavier just your drone and then you're kind of shoot, chasing your tail so you're obviously aware of this with lidar systems this thing will only fly for probably 20 minutes under optimal conditions um but it can be as low as 10 minutes under windy conditions so i see lidar technology the biggest thing holding it back is um, the weight of the LiDAR systems, and we're seeing that LiDAR might be getting smaller and more miniaturized yeah, with, um, yeah. with um, solid state LiDAR systems, and also with battery technology. If we can get batteries that can pump out a lot more power, then we should be able to fly for a lot longer. But as it stands, um, 20 <coughs> minutes kind of isn't enough, I don't think, unless you're changing lots and lots of batteries, and a set of these batteries are probably you know, $800, yeah. so yeah, yeah, it's yeah. expensive. Yeah, so. You're well aware of the issue. I don't know what the answer is other than the technology uh, getting lighter. I have been spoken with, with uh, the representative from DJI regarding mm -hmm. the, the TB47S, the battery, yeah. and the, the 48. Now, there's nothing coming in the market to yeah. upgrade. It's yes, it's still like that. So. That's right. Yeah. So I'm waiting to see yeah, what the next, <laughs> the next drone yeah. is in terms yeah. of lift capacity and also with lighter systems. I know. Lighter. I know. It's a very dumb, dumb part there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tim, how you going? I have a question for you. The sub, the, sub, the, the, the the unit you use for for testing, you know, the water with the pump, the yeah. pump unit attached yeah. to the matrix. Yeah. Do you guys have it some kind of right for information, open thing where we can see how it has been built? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, there was no IP uh, put on it. Yeah. Um, it's just a bunch of components that. We put together, so I've got it all. Um, it's now commercially available as well. Um, so Sphere who um, designed yeah. the drone with us, but yeah, I've got access. That, that's been important for us in Tasmania because the most of the reservoir, you know, are three hundred kilometers away in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. with no access. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we use the drone for every single yeah, part. It's, yeah, all the parts are available and we can get them combined together. Yeah. So if I send you an email, you will. Sure. Send it to the right oh, link. Definitely. Awesome. Right. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thanks very much. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, um, good, really good presentation, guys. Well done. It's excellent. And uh, right, just thinking of the topic, which is applications of water engineering, just wondering if you could just elaborate on other examples of where you think drone technology could be used in water engineering, or is it just a function? of what sensors you can actually put on, on the drone. If I could jump in, one thing I'm seeing emerging from drones is getting surface velocities from imagery in videos. Um, so <laughs> as computational power increases, um, there's a lot of research being put into taking a cheap consumer grade drone, flying it above a river during a discharge or flood event mm -hmm. and being able to get surface current. So mm -hmm. in that sense, we're waiting for the, the, uh, the research to push the bounds with drones, but like you said, sensors as well play a big part in, in how drones can be used in, in the water industry. Um, I would love to get bathymetry from a drone. There is one company that's selling a drone that can get a drone bathymetry, sorry, a drone LiDAR system, but it costs half a million dollars. So no one's going to pay for that. And it only works when it's crystal clear water and it gets a profile. So I'm watching that space. Uh, not very deep. It's 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 an emerging thing. Um, it was kind of released at one of these trade shows, but it's not really a viable product. So, it's a when the the bathycopter gets 
you know, fifty thousand dollars, then maybe it's viable. But I would love to get bathymetry through a drone. I think that'd be so useful for water engineering. Um, I can jump in there. Um, so uh, within the wastewater um, space, um, in the um, uh, especially within sewage trunks, so large sewer mains, currently asset inspections are done by uh, traverses, so manned entry. Um, uh, there is has been some technology, so using basically floating pontoons down large sewage trunks um, to inspect the pops of censoring. Uh, to inspect the internal surfaces of those assets. However, um, a brief has been put out by City Water uh, to um, develop um, the ponds drones, um, so into those types of assets, um, running fixed transects um, uh, for that same purpose. So, in, so increasing, reducing the costs, increasing the frequency, um, uh, the greater understanding of asset condition mm -hmm. in those, particularly in wastewater systems. Chris, I'm not a water engineer, but uh, it occurs to me that there is actually drones, bathymetry drones, and they're boats. That's right. And, <laughs> and they have little sounders and things. I'm, I know nothing yeah. about them. Have you I do, in and that? I've got quotes, and they're upwards of $100,000, um, and they can't come into the near shore, near shore zone. So I'm a coastal engineer. I want to get near shore bathymetry. You can't get a drone boat that'll go through um, the surf zone or near breakwaters or outside estuary entrances that are going two metres a second. So um, I'd love to see more investment into autonomous boats or drone boats, um, but the money's not there as much as there are for people who want to take a selfie from one of these. So <laughs> there's a lot of R&D on these ones and not a lot on the, uh, the boats. Mm. Mm. Okay. So... One question, how yes. accurate is the uh, LIDAR technology for a uh, highly vegetated area? For example, if you have a one meter uh, grass, uh, based on your experience, can be used LIDAR to capture the uh, surface? Yeah, so one thing to keep in mind with these LIDAR systems is they are miniaturized, which means they don't have the same power as the LIDAR systems that you put in an aeroplane. Mm -hmm. And as a result, their ability to penetrate veg is reduced compared to the Fugaro LiDAR systems that have flown over New South Wales. My experience is that um, if, if you've got a dense veg with leaves, leaves and you can't see the ground visually, you're not gonna get a LiDAR data point through to the ground. They, um, this system only has dual return, so it's, um, it's limited in its ability to punch through veg. But what it can do is because it's collecting so many data points per second, is if you have like a little gap filtered gaps between vegetation, it, it is able to find that one point that'll go through to the ground. Um, if uh, the example is if you've got grasses, yes, it'll see the ground. If you've got a rainforest, it's not gonna see the ground. I, I don't know, it's, it's hard to draw the line in the sand, um, but the technology is not as good as the system that you'd get in a big aeroplane, just because it needs to be lighter. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but you get variable results in terms of punching through veg. Just got an academic question too, Chris and uh, it's Craig. What's the go with your accuracy when you don't have any ground control? So did you test your poor botany flight without ground control? What was what your elevation accuracy you were getting without that, those four inducing? So so with the poor botany flight, this drone hadn't come out. This little dome here is an RTK receiver. I was forced to use the one before this, which was just a Phantom 4. Phantom 4, when it takes a photo, only knows where it is accurate for 10 metres vertically, which is why I smashed it with 70 ground control points. I didn't waste my time processing it without it because it would have been just wrong. Um, I haven't personally done any tests with this one without ground control points, but there's a supplier that claims you only need one ground control point to shift it vertically. I'm very dubious. And I will never only run with one or two ground control points because, like I said, I've been burnt in the past where you go out on site, you do a flight. Um, I was doing a breakwater. I didn't put a ground control point on the end of the breakwater. And as a result, my photogrammetry point cloud did a big banana. So, you know, hard experience. You need ground control points. Don't ignore them and take the time when you're in the field to collect them. So <laughs> that's my experience. Yeah. 
Yeah, and if you did one, you'd have this That's right. going on. Yeah. You'd know what was going on. Um, we, we played with years ago with the sense fly because they said that you could get similar compatible results. You know, not quite as reliable, but pretty close. And look, we flew in pretty perfect conditions and yeah, it was pretty close. It was uncomfortably good. I was, I was <laughs> wanting to see it fail and it didn't. Um, we, we did tests. Uh, the very first little project I did was in Narrabeen Beach and we flew quite a long strip and we put 10 ground control points in and we just flew the lot. And then when we processed it, we processed it with all 10 and then just with six, took these two out, and then just with four and tried to look at how things changed. And it certainly bows in the middle. You know, the, the, the model bows in the middle. But yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of ground control. I'm a surveyor. I'm a surveyor. We're always marking our territory, right? We can't leave. <laughs> <laughs> sticking something in the ground. You know, there's 220,000 survey marks in New South Wales that Lands Department have to look after somehow. But, you know, I'm pretty happy about that. Thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions, then let's thank again our speakers. the event and I hope you come along to the next Sydney Water Panel event. Uh, watch the space. We don't have an event just yet it's in the pipeline, but uh, watch the space. I get that. It's still in the pipeline.